Okay, there is one last segment, and here it is. It's kind of like a conclusion. The integration is you. The integration is me. Each one of us is a potential king under the king. And the integration process is like a series of spokes with him at the hub. And each kingdom is a spoke in the wheel of Christ. That's the integration. If we go back to the drawing, it's another way, in in its own way, is a little more accurate, is that you have a sheet of paper, place it in portrait mode in front of you, draw a line from the lower left corner to the upper right, so it's a diagonal. Every dot that makes up that line, every imaginary dot, is a kingdom. So now, cut a series of transverse lines that are also diagonal, inter- bisecting, intersecting with that diagonal line. And those are all the kingdoms. And therefore, all of the page gets filled up, and everybody to the right and the left of the diagonal line is part of a kingdom and the king is on that diagonal line that could be you that could be me that could be your neighbor next door that could be your worst enemy your best friend your mother your father you know somebody you know other than you it's never too late and it's the biggest hardest task in the world because it's a thinking thing. Money always goes to the thinkers. There are always hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds who can do body jobs. But thinking jobs, those are hard. They take years and years and years of training. A lawyer is a thinking job. A doctor is a thinking job. A politician is a thinking job. That's where the money goes. Okay, scientist, that's a thinking job. And you go to school and you learn this and you learn that and you learn a whole bunch of stuff and what you have to learn how to do the most is think. The money goes to the thinkers. Even your great painters and your great basketball players and your great ballerinas and your great pianists, you don't get to the great stage without becoming a thinker. Kings, thinkers. They're the heads of the kingdom. What does the head do? It thinks. You're supposed to get the head of Christ into your head. That's 1 Corinthians 1, 5 in the Greek. His words in your words. But they don't translate it well enough so you can't tell that. And then Paul talks about it again later in um, Romans 12, 1 through 3 where the Greek word latreia, which is translated worship, he's making a play on thinking there. Your thinking is the worship. Oh boy. See how embarrassing this is going to be at the Bema? At the judgment seat of Christ? Millions upon millions of Christians, many of them teachers, are going to be standing before God, hitting their head, saying, why didn't I could have had a V8? They spent all their life in Bible, but they never learned it. It's You can know something and yet not learn it. I'm sure you've got to have had experience with that in your lifetime. Where you you have something that's really familiar to you, and yet one day you realize you don't know anything about it. You've got lots of words about it in your head, and you can recite them in your sleep, and yet you know nothing. I mean, think of school. That's a real good example. How many years in the United States do we have to go to school? 12. And what do we know when we get out? Not a damn thing. Can barely read and write. It's really shameful. 
American education. Okay? But you can say pretty much the same thing in any other country of the world, too. They, they, they're not learning. They're memorizing. They're storing information in their heads. That's not learning it. You don't learn something until you understand why. And there's not a soul, or very few, let's say. Very few people, if you said to them, Why did Jesus Christ die on the cross? They'll say, For my sins. Well, so? Why was it necessary for him to die on the cross for your sins? How could that do anything? And how did he die? How, how could his dying pay for your sins? And I mean, for centuries, people have maintained that he died physically to pay for your sins. Bible says he died in his soul. That he actually paid for your sins while he was alive with his thinking. That's Isaiah 53.11. But that do yatzik, those two Hebrew words. By means of his truth knowledge he makes righteous. That's the translation. So how come the scholars don't know that? Because they didn't learn the Bible. They memorized it. They memorized all kinds of tomes written by other scholars. And dear Dr. So-and-so says this. And dear Dr. So-and-so says that. And that's because the truth does not matter to them. What matters to them is who says it. They don't care what the Bible says. They care that dear Dr. So-and-so said it. So they memorized dear Dr. So-and-so. And then they all spout it back to each other. Nobody learning the Bible itself. You can memorize it, you can spout it, you can say it in the original words, and you don't know a thing. So you are the integration. That's the conclusion. When you're learning and living on Bible, it is integrating inside you. God is making that happen. So you become the integration to everything else. You're going to go through all kinds of vicissitudes because of it. It's going to be elating to know. It's going to be disturbing to know. Most of the time disturbing. It's tiring to know. You're going through the same exact what do you want to call it? Curse is a norm, really. You're going through the same exact steps that Christ went through by divine design. This is how the spiritual life works. The spiritual life he had is the spiritual life you get. And it might run fast. It might run slow. It'll do both. Some, some you know, years, you'll learn so much Bible in one year, year and the pieces will come together for you so fast you'll you'll just be amazed and then in other years it's like you didn't grow at all but actually you are you just it's different kinds of growth it's growth you can see and it's growth you can't see God knows what he's doing and he's getting you ready for that eternal state now here's the point you are important your growth today, every day, every little thing that you can do to apply Bible to it and learn something more about God from it, that is history. My pastor stressed this for 50 years. It's not like I'm pulling it out of the air. And there's a lot of Bible verses over the, you know, over the years that I've done when doing these audios that you can think of and just ask God to show you some. There's so many. You make history. Not Donald Trump. Not whoever's going to be elected for president. Not whoever's going to be elected as prime minister or wherever your home country and your host country is. Whoever the, the big movers and shakers there are in business or government or politics or the arts or school or whatever. They don't make history. You do. That is your lot in life. Somebody is born royal. They, it's, hey, you believed in Christ. You didn't know what you were getting into when you did that. 
A baby is born royal. Baby doesn't know that. Baby has no idea what royal means. You're in that situation. This is where you are. This is your office. This is your destiny. This is your lot in life. You're born royal. When you were born again, you were born royal. You might be royal in other ways too. Chances are you are. Because probably every single one of us has a king or a queen or a prince or a princess. Or, you know, blah, blah, blah. Somewhere in our background. This planet has been around for four, five thousand, six thousand years. 6121. Since Adam's fall. However long the planet was before that, nobody knows. Planet's been around 6,121 years since Adam's fall. As of 2015, I guess I can say it's... Yeah, because the fiscal year is still 6,121. It'll soon be 6,122 at the vernal equinox. Okay, so now... How many kings and queens and princes and little, you know, uh, kingdoms that are sometimes no bigger than a dunghill have there been? Thousands upon thousands upon thousands. And everybody runs through the Middle East. So you probably have some of Abraham's genes in you. Probably everybody does. Because, I mean, God did make that promise. And you probably have some king or queen or prince or princess somewhere in your background going back 6,000 years, at least one. And that's probably true for every person on this planet. With all the interbreeding there's been. And nobody's more prolific at having kids than the Jews and the Arabs. And they've gone all over the world. And, you know, they kind of just do it to anything that moves. And the women tend to be really beautiful. And the men tend to be really handsome, so they're, you know, people are attracted, and, you know, stuff happens. So probably everybody's got a little bit of Abraham's genes in them. And everybody's got somebody royal in their background. And everybody's probably got a rapist in their background, and a thief in their background. And other sordid characters that you would really rather never know about. So what? They didn't make history. Not to God. When the books are open at the end, the ones who make history are those who mature in Christ. And prior to him coming, those who made history, like Moses, were those who matured in him, you know, in their older spiritual life. But the older spiritual life didn't have the opportunity to grow as far because he hadn't come yet. But we inherit the spiritual life after his victory. So we can go a lot farther. Faster and farther. So that's what you really need to remember. And you'll have trouble with it. I have trouble with it every day. It's not fun. It is meaningful, and it is what will get you through the day. I am royal. I am royal family of God. The value of me is the doctrine in me. The value of me is what Christ paid for me. There is no other value that, that counts. I am making history right now while I talk. Somebody in heaven is watching me while I lay here on my back talking into a microphone. This will be talked about in heaven sometime today because they're learning from us Peter even said that angels long to look is the phrase in English translation and I don't remember where it is and Peter you're supposed to look it up if angels are longing to look at us to learn stuff about God that tells you how high our spiritual life is so then you're making history right now just by listening whether it's to me or to somebody else any thinking you do they're listening to you you're the star of your own movie because you're making history not the people you see on the boob tube 
not the rich people going to their, you know, unless you happen to be one of them, going to their little meetings or whatever. Not the poor people grousing about the rich people. Not the black people grousing about the white people. Not the white people grousing about the black people. Not the Hispanics grousing about everybody else or everybody else grousing about the Hispanics. What makes America great is not fixing the immigration problem. What makes America great is not fixing the stupid Muslim problem. What makes America great is not, uh, what, what was, what's the other big issue that's supposed to be, you know, so important? Um, solving corporate inversions. Oh, please. That's where you sell your company's assets to another company outside your country so that you don't get taxed in this country. And then you really are still operating the same company, but you're doing it from the foreign company. That's a loophole. And it's wrong. But it, it it's not important. What's important is what's going on inside your head today. God is going to bless or curse you and everybody in your periphery based on what's inside your head today. That makes history. There's nobody else on earth who can do that. Because it's a divine power. You don't have that power. God's going to choose what to do based on what you learn. And why is he going to do that? Because he likes to do it that way. I'm pleased at what I hear you think right now. So I'm going to bless blah, 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 blah. And I don't even know who he's blessing. I only know he's doing it. He's deployed you in a certain geographical space. He's given you a certain job. Okay? If he hasn't yet, it's because he doesn't want to until later. Ask him about everything. He has a will for your life on every topic, even if and when you brush your teeth. And you want to exercise that, not to be anal and call yourself a good person, but to get in the habit of associating everything you do with your body with something to do with him. Because when you're king, that's how it'll be. And when you're king and you're doing that, everybody's going to be watching you. Just like some angels watching you right now. Just get used to it. God is watching you right now. If you go to the bathroom, some angel or angels or maybe some humans in heaven. I'm not quite sure how that works. But if angels look, then humans probably do too. And God is watching you. So just learn to stop being embarrassed or worried about it right now. Yes, be freaked out. Some, some demons watching you. Your guardian angels watching you. You're never alone. I mean, you can be chained to a hospital bed and still execute the spiritual life. Isn't God just total genius that he would design it like this? There's no restriction. Do you want it? Then you get it. If you say, God, oh, I'm changing my hospital bed now. You know, you broke your leg. Or maybe you got cancer. Okay, I want the spiritual life. Okay, then if he wants you to have it too, chances are the answer is yes, because that's usually the answer. Why would he say no? Maybe that's why you're where you are now. So that you get the time to have the spiritual life. So okay, then you keep on having the cancer, but it doesn't kill you. And yet it's not so hard or so bad that you can't learn. And he finds a way that you can find your te your teacher on the internet or something. Okay, and so now you're laid up in bed and oh, but that makes it more convenient for you to study all the time. Yeah, what do you think? So you're like Denzel Washington in The Bone Collector. And he makes it so that you can have all the technological gugas around you so that you can study scripture while you're sick. And maybe you stay sick for a while until you know it well enough and then maybe just one day all of a sudden it all goes away. He's done that. See, miracles always have a purpose. 
God doesn't just do a miracle to, you know, wow you. He always does it to teach something. Or maybe in that state, chain to a bed, in two years, you grow what would have taken me 20 years. And then you die. But you're mature. It can happen. God is God. He can do anything. You see the point? You're making history now. Not the people on television. Not the politicians. Not the rich people. Not the poor people by virtue of their wealth or their poverty, okay? Not the well people. Not the sick people. Not all the events you hear around you. The world thinks that its activity is what makes history. No. They're just the extras on the stage. You're the lead actor. Uh, it's real important to come to grips with that. You're the historically important person. Everything that's happening is around you is happening for your sake. It seems maybe like it's the other way around. But it's happening for your sake. Okay? They need you. And obviously in whatever circumstances you are, you have a need for certain others too. You have your physical needs... You have a need for certain others in your periphery. You have all kinds of needs yourself. But of the two, they need you to be doing your job. And all of your kingdom that's going to exist, but doesn't exist, but going to exist, needs you now. This is what Christ had to be thinking every day. I'm Messiah. He had to come to grips with himself. And my pastor said this, and I'm beginning to understand it now. He said, in the last stage of your spiritual life, last stage of spiritual maturation, the kinks in your soul get worked out. Which is basically, you learn to orient to yourself. You have relationship to God, relationship to life, but you also have in the middle of the two, relationship to yourself. Who am I? What am I? Why am I here? How should I think about me? And the whole world is preoccupied with that question. Never ever coming to any learning. Ever learning but never coming to any epinosis knowledge of God. Second Corinthians uh Second Timothy two two twenty six through three seven. They're ever learning. Who am I? What do I do? I must have self worth. I must have self esteem. Blah, 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 blah. I'm a good person. If you have to tell people you're a good person, you're not. Just, if you have the urge to tell somebody you're good, like Donald Trump is always telling everybody how good he is. Honey, if you have to tell me you're good, you're not. Now, shallow people tell other shallow people that that's positive thinking and positive reinforcement and you should promote yourself. Not in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom, you're already credited with Christ's own righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 So the question of your self-worth is irrelevant and, important and, because you have Christ's righteousness, you're making history. Because it's His righteousness in you. So now, what has to be filled, what fills up that righteousness? Because the righteousness is like a potential. It's real, but it's like, it's your position in Christ. What turns that position on into a function? Doctrine. Getting filled up with Bible doctrine. So the historic stuff that's happening in this world right now is you living and learning on Bible today. Me living and learning on Bible today. Anyone else living and learning on Bible today? How many people are really doing that? Everybody's talking Bible, but how many are learning it? I can't tell you how many Bible classes I had before I actually started to learn it. It must have been 10, 15 years. 
I, I really do. I don't think I really understood scripture, even though I could cite it off the top of my head. And I knew every doctor my pastor taught, and I understood it, I thought, and I believed it. But it didn't hit home. The reality of it, the meaning of it, the why of it, didn't hit home. So from 1975 to 1995 is 20 years, plus three, because 1998 was watershed for me. 23 years. And I could cite all the doctrines he said in my sleep. And he taught more doctrine than most pastors do. And frankly, that was true of the whole congregation. Uh, let's see, what, 2,000, 5,000 in the congregation, but they didn't all show up every day. And you know, of those people, and I saw them every day, I think I knew two who actually learned what he taught. And I count myself as not having learned what he taught even though I could spout what he taught, and they all could too. Until it gelled 23 years later. Now when it gels, then you realize, oh bleep, this is real. I'm important, I got doctrine in me. The value of me is the doctrine. This isn't a joke. This isn't a fairy tale. This isn't something that, that sounds nice or a set of principles that seem to be true or ought to be true. This is really happening. And then you recognize, oh my gosh, this stuff is really revolving around me. I'm the one making history. At which point you either want to go run under a rock or you want to embrace it. And you'll have both attitudes on any given moment, on any given day. But the fact is, you are making history. God is going to bless or curse your periphery, your region, your country, the world, based on what you learn or don't learn today. Same thing for me. So you make history, not the people who think they're making history. You are literally making history. This is not, it's not a figure of speech or a nice thing to say. It's literal. The history that you're making is the history of the future. See, tomorrow hasn't happened yet. But when it does, today will be history. There won't be a tomorrow if today doesn't complete properly. The future is always contingent on the past. The future is always the product of the past. So you are literally making history. The history of the future of the eternal state is literally being made by each of us right now who is learning and living on Bible. Because that's like, think of links in a chain. Links of his thinking in a chain. All connecting, 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 connecting. And we're all connected enough, bang oh, the rapture occurs. And the balloon goes up. Because then the thinking pattern in aggregate that's needed to reflect him has been completed. And what pattern is that? My pastor finally realized that the thinking pattern that God is building is the king's. The king's. And it was a watershed moment for him because he had always been saying that, you know, 10%, between 5 and 10% of Christians are actually spiritually growing. And that was his own estimate. And he called that the pivot. And that prosperity occurs in a nation because we're not supposed to be a Christian nation. That's not even an issue. But the prosperity comes to a nation where 5 or 10% of the Christians in it are actually growing. And he, he, he spent most of his career trying to figure out how do you show that. 
and he went through you know European history and all the rest of this to show the various periods in European history where there was positive volition the Bible blah 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 and you can actually trace it pretty easily it seems to run in 200 year cycles if you get a book by Christopher de Hamel called the Bible and it's his he was only writing on the story of how we got our Bible but see how you how the Bible changed reflects the interest or disinterest in it he didn't know that or if he did he didn't write about it but that taught, dovetailed with what my pastor was saying so I, I was I got the book by the Hamill and it's a really beautiful book it's really important to get and um, you can see that that's happening now what does that tell you that tells you that the when believers are enough in a country that are growing prosperity therefore comes to that country that's why China is going through prosperity now that's why India is going through prosperity now especially Africa is going through prosperity now and to some extent some regrowth in Latin America that's why the United States is on the wane because our interest in Bible is declining which is really pathetic because we've got the best technology ever for learning the Bible fastest and really learning it, okay? Really connecting the dots, and we're not interested. Same thing is true for Europe. I don't know about Russia, okay? There seems to be some positive volition in Ukraine. Now, what's the point of that? God sees all these dots, and all those dots of all those people learning and living on Bible are the reason why we're still here. They're making history, literally. They're making today justified so that now tomorrow can occur. And you and I are probably part of that. If I'm talking and you're listening, because this is about Bible. I'm doing it in order to think through the issues. Try to close this topic. Okay? I'm making history when I talk. You're making history when you listen. You don't have to be listening to me, but just when you listen to anything about Bible or think about it. Even if you're washing the dishes or going to the bathroom. That's making history. Because it's what you're doing with your head, not what you're doing with your body. That makes history. That blesses the world. You are literally ruling now. You don't have to die first. Same thing for me, same thing for every believer. And by contrast, those who are not using their spiritual heritage, their spiritual royalty to learn and live on Bible, are cursing the world. Well, those cursing the world with their rejection of Bible in favor of their good deeds or in favor of their religiosity or in favor of their catering to public opinion or in favor of their human approbation or in favor of their ego they're cursing history they're making history too but it's negative history and sooner or later every 490 years God cleans those people out and we're, we've started that period now the the 120 year clean out period started in March of 2010 I might be off by 30 years it might have started um, 30 years earlier I, I still have to work that out with Paul okay so we're either 5 years into or 35 years into the last 120 years of the cleaning period just like he said before the flood and there was a four, four generations, 120 years. So that's the characteristic of the end of the 490. When God cleans house because there are too many bad Christians in it. Okay, too many bad believers, I should say. Because a lot of people who call themselves Jews are actually believing in Christ also. So that's a big issue. You're making history and they're making history. We're all making history for better or for worse by whether or not we're learning and living on Bible. So you got an offset of the cursing with the offset of the blessing and those who are actually learning and living on Bible are few. But the quality is so high. It doesn't take many. Now, 
what my pastor was also saying, that was what he called the pivot. Five, ten percent. Especially at ten percent, prosperity accrues to the region which has got the, those Christians growing in it. But there's another level, and this is where we get back to the kings I was talking about. There's a group in the Old Testament, the name was Jeshurun, meaning upright. Okay? The few, like in the Old Testament, it was Moses, Caleb, Joshua. The few in a country. And they're very few, obviously. That's three people out of six million, including kids. And including, of course, you know, the Egyptians who came along and converted. All right? Three. And he was trying to figure out what is the ratio of Jeshurun to a populace that preserves the nation. He tried to figure that out from 1997 until he had to retire due to Alzheimer's in 2003. Okay? And basically his idea was, well, you can argue it's maybe 1 to 6 million for Moses. Could be as high as 3 to 6 million, including Caleb and Joshua. All right, but that's a higher level than just growing spiritually. Okay, that's what he like. What he would end up calling supermaturation. Okay. Now, that maturation level, of course, Moses got to. What my pastor didn't know, but I can prove now, is that God awards you the whole world. 490 years or a thousand years based on supermaturation. I couldn't find such an award for Joshua or Caleb, but I did find the timing for Moses. Okay? The temple was keyed to Moses' own supermaturation date. Right? I so the thousand years must have been true also. I found it for Noah, I found it for a bunch of people. I didn't find it for for um Caleb and Joshua. So if that's true then, it's still true now. Because those rules haven't changed. Okay? It stands to reason that it's harder to get there, but the rules haven't changed. So Jeshurun, therefore, means one or two or three in a nation that may or may not, because we don't know the rule, it's New Testament now, that may or may not have some kind of ratio to the number of bodies in the nation. In other words, there's about 300 million people in the United States right now. How many Jeshurun, that's what he was trying to figure out. How many Jeshurun do there have to be to preserve the United States? Because as far as he was concerned, in 1997, it looked like the United States only had 40 years to survive. Which means that the country might die by 2037. So here you are, here I am, if we're both in the U.S., we're going to want to mature quickly. We might be Jashurin, or we might be Jashurin candidates. And we want that, because we don't want the United States to go down, do we? And if your native state or native home is Germany or France or China or India, you want to grow. That's the most patriotic thing you can do for your country. Grow spiritually. Be a Jashurin. That makes history the same way it made history in the case of Moses. That's why that story is told. So we can understand the importance of growing spiritually. So, you know, I mean, I ramble a lot as I usually do. But you get the sense of, oh, wow. You know, because when Moses was doing his thing, the world didn't know of him. And if you were to say all this... Even about Moses, who pretty much everybody's heard of by now. He made history, all right? I mean, the whole world depended on him leading those people out of Egypt and into the Promised Land. And the law that got written then, every country on earth right now has adopted that law in some form or, or another. Every country. There is some version of the Ten Commandments in the Constitution of every country on this planet. Whether they observe it or not is another story. But in form? Oh yeah. 
even North Korea. No one of the few rogue nations left. North Korea and Iran are the two rogue nations left in the world. Everybody else has pretty much joined the international community. But even Iran and even North Korea, much to their chagrin if they paid attention, their constitutions are based on the Mosaic Law. So what Moses did made history. But you would have never guessed. All he was doing is leading people in a circle around the Negev. Around and around and around for 40 years. Okay? And a year before he dies, he writes Genesis. In Psalm 90. And I don't know when he wrote the rest of it. I haven't done the meter yet. That man made history. But at the time he was writing those books and leading the people, you know, around in circles, he didn't, you know, well, he might have known, but nobody would have thought who encountered those people that they were making history. They would have thought, oh, well, these, are, these are really crazy people wandering around the desert. Forty years in the desert. That's what your life is going to seem like. You're just wandering around, and it has no significance. No, you're making history, but it won't be seen while you're alive. So you have to orient to it now and think of Christ now, because that's He's the prototype with Moses. Book of Hebrews compares Moses and Christ. Christ is the update on Moses. Okay, Christ is down. He's in Jerusalem. He's in Nazareth. Dusty little town. I mean, Nazareth was much more prosperous than it is today. Today, you, you don't even dare go there. Okay? Dusty little town. The Roman Empire considered Jerusalem to be the armpit of the world. If, if your boss hated you, he sent you to Israel. On assignment. Pilate was sent to Israel to be the procurator. That meant that Pilate was in disgrace by whoever was his superior in Rome. Okay? That was a place you didn't want to go. Because it was ungovernable. The Romans basically considered it ungovernable and that's why they had Herod in charge, essentially. And then they were there alongside. Because the Jews were always fighting each other. Nobody would have thought that some preacher guy, because everybody and his brother was Messiah, that some guys, hi, I'm from the royal house of David, who's been dead for thousands of years. Thousand years, actually. Because the deadline for Christ's own death was a thousand years from David's. Okay, and that's in the Old Testament. But the point is, is he's walking this dusty road between Jerusalem and Nazareth saying, God, 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 God. Nobody in his right mind would have thought this guy was making history. And yet today, 2,000 years later, there's nobody who doesn't know about him. Whether they believe in him or not is another story. But there's nobody who doesn't know about him. There's not a single person on this planet who isn't affected by his life, whether they know it or not. So he made history. So are you, so am I. We don't see it. There was no way to see how Christ was making history when he was here. He had to walk. He had to eat. He had to sleep. He had to pee. He's just another human. Something funny about him that made you pay attention to him more than others. Something funny about him that made you remember him. But he's just another human. Okay? That's the way it is for you. That's the way it is for me. We can't see the history we're making, but we're making it. Not the people on TV. Unless they're believers too. 
And then they're making history probably for the worse. Because they don't sound like they know Christ too well. Some of them mouth his name. And they're more apostate. The teachers? How many of the teachers actually know Christ? They mouth his name a lot. They can quote the Bible a lot. They're in the pulpits a lot. But do they actually know him? You can't tell. So do you know him? You'll probably think, well, I surely don't know him enough. Fine, then start to know him better. Because you're making history, and so am I. Peace out.